Hi, I'm Robin Gully. I'm John Justin. Um, we are here to give you your council recap. Um, and actually, I'm going to say most of the sort of most interesting things that we did in council today happened in the open council work session. Yeah, I would say so. Um, so we're it's gonna, all interesting. Of it's course. all interesting. Watch it all. You'll yeah, love it. yeah. Uh. <laughs> Stick with us. You'll see. Um, so we actually opened uh, open council work session today by talking about um, the potential for a grant that we're applying for that we think we have a pretty good chance of getting. Um, we have a serious problem with um, opioids here in uh, West St. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you were going to take this. And, and also South St. Paul. And you know, a lot of that is just the proximity. We're really in kind of an urban sort of area and we're lumped in with Dakota County and most areas of Dakota County are more distant from the city, are more just separately popular. Everybody, opioids are a problem everywhere. Let's not confuse that. But when you have a dense population and you have a you know five square mile city right adjacent to a large city, you're going to have more here. Yeah. And so we ran into the problem where because of the way that the funding came down, you had to be over 30,000 people to get direct funding on the opioid problem. Uh, and so that money goes to the county unless you have over 30,000 people. We don't have over 30,000 people, neither does South St. Paul. But we are the highest per capita opioid problem. And so we've been working with the county and they've been receptive to try and get funding directed to us, which I think would only be fair. But in the meantime, we're also going to take a look at uh, ORAC. I am not going to opioid. I, I so yeah, opioid response and education. Nope, that's no, the sorry, thing we're that's doing. <laughs> anyway, ORAC stands for something. It has to do with a grant that we're working on. And actually, South Metro Fire Department is leading the charge on this. Um, with support from West St. Paul and South St. Paul and also would affect West St. Paul and South St. Paul. The big thing is this money would be used to establish uh, community opioid response and education, CORE, lovely, another acronym for everybody. And what that really means is we'd be bringing in three, three people, a community EMT, um, a peer recovery specialist, and a licensed uh, drug and alcohol counselor to kind of do proactive work to get to people. This is not going to be what we don't want to be is we don't want to be in the spot where we're dealing with this problem at the point of either medical intervention uh, at a hospital or criminal intervention. Um, we want to try to get there earlier, try to provide resources with people that are struggling potentially with opioids, try to get them not only into some sort of counseling mode, get them, you know, talking with people, seeing what we can do to help, but also things like uh, fentanyl test strips and, and Narcan and stuff that can just keep people safe. Um, and the idea of kind of doing it in a not like, well, you're in trouble now, so we're going to force you to do this, try to proactively get people in a better spot, maybe help them get outside of the grip of their opioid issues. And uh, I think that's a great thing. I think preventative is always the best way to go about this. It's much trickier to do it once you're in a criminal proceeding or something like that. So I think it's a great idea. Um, staff seems extremely confident that they really have a good a good proposal written up. And, you know, yeah, really what we want at the end of the day is we want to, we don't want to have the level of overdoses and the level of near overdoses and all of this stuff going on. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, obviously it's community safety, but it's personal safety. It's, it's, it's residents of our city that are struggling and we want to help them out. So that's, I, hopefully we can get that over the line. Also, I think that the county is still going to participate with us and kind of push some funds our way that we certainly deserve because we are the ones that are kind of <laughs> at the tip of this, this list. And so I'm optimistic about how all of that's gonna work. And then, you know, the one thing I, I brought up is that if we do get this established, I wanna start planning, it's a three-year thing, you know, I wanna start planning for how we continue to do this because assuming it's a success, I don't want the bottom to drop out. If right. we've established these relationships with people that are struggling, what I don't want is suddenly year four, we don't have any budget, we don't have any funding, we don't have any additional grants coming in and suddenly the support network that's doing good work the worst thing we can do is have that drop out from under people that are struggling and now their support network's gone and they're more likely to, to have more difficulties than, than not. So that's, I'm optimistic. I think it's a good program. I think we're gonna hopefully get it through and uh, implement it and I think it'll be great. I think so and um, just to add a little bit more context, part of the reason that we're confident that we're gonna get this grant money, I mean, Mm -hmm. <laughs> but is that we've already been doing some 
really innovative things. Like yes. we have a social worker that we work with all the time. Yep. Um, and so our city has been really working to create more uh, sort of better ways to mm -hmm. reach out to our community and to be proactive about these things. What's really cool about this program that we're hopefully going to pilot is that the folks who will be part of this core team um, will proactively go out and um, and build relationships with mm -hmm. people who we know are struggling yep. um, with the idea that they can you know offer help and offer resources and offer ways um, to get people treatment and literally you know if somebody needs treatment like take them help them figure out how to pay yep. for it help them yep. like get the resources that they need to to get better yep and I think that you can look at a, a really successful program we've had with our mental health, dedicated mental health officer uh, through our police department, which has been a huge thing. And again, it's the same sort of idea. It's getting out to people before they're in crisis that are willing kind of opt in and are looking for help. And we get there and we establish a relationship with that officer. And if they are going to be in, in a situation with any sort of police thing, yeah. that officer is there to be a friendly face, someone they know has understands their situation and and it, i feel like this is a similar approach and i think these are the approaches that cities are going to have to start to figure out mm -hmm. as we move forward with you know both mental health and also obviously uh, often a closely related thing which is addiction and and abuse of, of substances these are not these are not two separate pieces no, all the definitely. time sometimes they are but but often they do bleed into each other and so I think we've got a good structure and a good understanding already going in. So I feel good about it. There we go. <laughs> and actually, I feel like this is a really good segue into talking about um, some other social safety net stuff that we're mm -hmm. working to build in. So uh, just so you know, I'm skipping around on the agenda a little bit. Um, so if you're actually watching the Open Council Work Session, um, I'm, go I'm taking this a little bit out of order on purpose because I want to talk about the metro area sales tax that's allocated for affordable housing. Um, you know, a lot of these issues that, that folks have in our community are really deeply intertwined. And when we can intervene on the front end, we can, we can help people before they're in crisis and before they start to spiral out of control. Um, and so the state adopted a 0.25% metro area sales tax, which is dedicated to affordable housing. And here in West St. Paul, we are going to get an allocation of roughly between $275,000 and $340,000 a year to, um, to support affordable, to support things in the realm of affordable housing. So the discussion that we had tonight, and actually I would love to hear feedback from folks if you have like, if you have a sense of how this could be best used in our community. Um, we were deciding how, basically how to use this money. Mm -hmm. um, so the city, uh, our awesome city staff came with a few different options. Um, the first one was that we could uh, create loans or grants for rehabbing existing affordable housing. Um, the second one was that we could create loans or grants for new affordable housing, which would be really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. But see, it's tricky. Um, the other thing that we could do would be to support individuals and families by offering emergency rental support or and or offering support for deposit and first month's rent um, and or offering ongoing support like Section 8 housing, mm -hmm. but on a local level. And then there'll be other, I think there's other possibilities there too. I had mentioned the idea of, can we look at transitional housing from houseless people into, you know, getting people through the steps that gets them safe and secure housing. And it isn't always rent assistance. It isn't always eviction protection. There's a, a whole spectrum. The trick is that when you only have 275 to $340,000 a year, Although that sounds like a lot, you want to use that money in the best way you can. And in truth, loans and grants to build new affordable housing, sadly, $300,000 does not buy you much. Right. Even, even rehabbing existing, $300,000 does not buy you that much. And so I think the general feeling of both staff and the council was that supporting the individuals and family side is a way that we could actually get the most positive effect for people. Um, and there was the idea you could pool it for three years 
and then you've got nine hundred thousand dollars and maybe that would be a grant that would make some affordable housing work but you're not building an affordable housing project for nine hundred thousand right. dollars it's just not possible so you're still partnering with somebody else that has to build it you're assisting them but does that really get us where we need to go? Plus, we wait three years before we have any effect. And I think we all feel pretty strongly that we want the most impact to go toward our families and our community mm -hmm. members mm -hmm. instead of going to landlords, instead of, you know, yep. you yep. know, I know there are good landlords out in yep. our community, but um, rather than going to prop up folks who have resources and have some stability already, we really yes. want it to go and to have the biggest impact on folks who are, um, who need extra help. Mm -hmm. And so that felt really important. And, you know, we even talked about whether we should partner, if we were doing this, should we partner with an outside um, organization? But uh, we're considering the possibility of doing it internally because we really want the All funding the money to, to go. Yeah, yeah. To Administrative costs with community. an outside organization would cut away on that. And so now you're taking a percentage of that money that's not going to, you know, no offense to the organizations at all. I understand you have to money yeah. to run an organization. Fortunately, we're already paying everybody to do their job here, so we don't have to pay them more to do this job. Um, the other thing I think we should mention is, uh, for those that are w wondering about why we're, you know, this money can only be used for this. It's earmarked yeah. specifically for this. It's not something we could put in the general fund. It's not something we could use to rehab anything outside of this very narrow parameter. And if we do not use it, mm -hmm. it reverts back. We don't get to keep the money if we don't spend it. So there is a reason to have this money and this expenditure go forward, similar to my harping every time I can, on yeah. please, please take our grants and rehab yeah. your, your, your stuff because we want to spend the money. It's the same sort of situation, so. The other thing that I just want to mention is that we talked about um, how many folks in our community that we knew of in the last year had expressed an urgent need for financial help to stave off an eviction. Mm -hmm. So just this one specific thing, right, which is maybe like we may choose a sort of broader way to use this funding, but there were a hundred families that we knew of in West St. Paul last year who called, um, called organizations to say, I'm on the edge of being evicted, can you help me? And so with this money, uh, this basically exact amount of money, we basically could have helped that number of families yep. to stay in their homes. Yep. But of course, we're also, uh, you know, part of the conversation was also about how we connect them with resources, how we connect them with the organizations that have um, mm -hmm. resources to help, how we, you know, how we help folks, not just uh, stop an eviction immediately, but um, get, sort of back to stability and get what they need to sort mm -hmm. of move on from it as well. So would love, um, you know, if you have yes. thoughts or ideas or if you think that something else would be more effective, if you're a renter who's been in this situation and you're like, no, what I really needed was mm -hmm. this, please, you know, send us a message or yep. right under this post or whatever and Absolutely. let us know how Absolutely. we can, how we can best, best use these resources. And I should mention the other thing I mentioned, in the meeting with the rehabbing existing affordable housing. The other thing is I think we're already on a trajectory there with our discussion about how we, in, you know, get renters' rights more out there and aware and we kind of keep our code and keep our standards of housing, of all housing higher um, and keep showing that. That to me is the way to get to that rehabbing existing affordable housing is just hold people to a high standard for safe, housing for people who are residents in our city. So mm -hmm. I'd rather I'd rather take this money and assist people and then use policy and ordinances and to push higher quality, better maintained housing yeah. from an administrative side. I think that's really the answer that I see. So, but we'll see if you have different ideas. I am not an expert in this field by yeah. any means. I'd love to have him, but I really yeah. would. So, um, I feel like we're like oh, we segueing get... into uh, things today because speaking of um, using policy to change the way that we do things, mm -hmm. um, I know John's like, why are you skipping around on the agenda again? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Just, you were, we're moving forward and we'll jump yeah, back. Yeah, we gotta jump couple, back up but, there. Um, yeah. So trees, disease trees. Um, had a conversation about that, about mainly what our policy is right now. 
and whether that's sufficient. Um, I think there were some differing opinions on it. You know, right now we, if it's a tree that is a public safety issue, um, then we will, we can declare it a public nuisance, we can require a removal, et cetera. We haven't really, we've sent out compliance letters, but we have not gone out and told people you have to cut this tree down or, or cut it down ourselves. The tricky balance here is, obviously it's not cheap to cut down a tree. And so going out and asking a resident, like you have to take that tree down or we're gonna you know, take it down and assess it to you, it's gonna put some people in a bad spot. At the same time, I've talked to a lot of people that are adjacent to properties with dead trees that they feel are a threat to their property, their, their safety, their personal safety. So this is a tough one for me because I really, I feel that I don't wanna put people in an economic quagmire because they can't afford to do it. But at the same time, I don't want people to just go, well, I don't have to deal with this until there's a catastrophe because that, <laughs> that ends that badly. To a catastrophe. Yeah, it's a catastrophe and hopefully it's just a monetary catastrophe and not a human, human catastrophe, exactly, or injury or something like that. So, well, and also there's the issue of the fact that um, when these trees become diseased, then the longer they sit there, the more they're spreading that disease to yes. other trees yeah. in our city. And we have, I mean, it. you can walk down any street in the city and see trees that have been um, the victims of emerald ash borer yep. um, and other kind of blight on trees. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's it's sad and it's difficult. And, yep. and also, yes, like it has, it, it's always been expensive to remove trees and it has gotten astronomically more expensive yeah. to remove yeah. trees in the last few years and so we you know we we talked about some potential ways to um to try to take the burden off of folks when they when they just don't have the money to do it mm -hmm. um it, I, I think we just the problem is we you can't go scorched earth policy where you're just like we're going to just tell everybody you have to cut this tree down I mean, we actually have the ability to do that, but I don't think we want to. I mean, that seems too much. Um, I think we might encourage people more strongly um, within the ordinances we have. I mean, we could, the ordinance stands that we could just it, make people do it. Nobody wants to be made to do something, but I think that we kind of have to nudge people a little bit more because this is a real concern. And I've talked to residents that are legitimately scared of what could happen if this tree they have no power over, they can't go over and cut their neighbor's tree down, thankfully. Um, and so we have to actually take that seriously too. And I, I, you know, it's, it's, we gotta find that middle ground. I don't know where that middle ground is. I think staff's gonna come back with maybe some ideas on that. Um, we did mention the idea of really encouraging and maybe looking for some grants for the treatment side of it for private properties, because the truth is, if we are going to slow down the emerald ash borer thing, and we have slowed it down in the city because we've been treating city trees where we have control over carefully and we've been offering we do offer a treatment schedule for people i just talked to somebody that was worried they weren't on the schedule and, and it was a glitch and we fixed it and their tree got treated i'm very happy about that but the concern is it's sort of everybody has to work together to stop this thing and if you've got somebody that's just like well i don't want to bother to treat my trees you could have the health, a nice healthy tree with treatment, but you know they treat every three years and the second yeah. year the borers get in there and now your tree's going. And so we need to kind of encourage people. There's an education piece um, and then maybe just a little harder push on really trying to get people to understand like you really shouldn't leave these things <laughs> to go. It, it, it doesn't get better. It's the, it's the old story. It doesn't get cheaper to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get easier to fix it. Um, it's definitely not better if it falls down. And so if we can kind of get people on the path of like, I know you're putting this off and I understand that, yeah. maybe we can help you, but you really, it's not in your best interest or anybody's best interest to just let this not be dealt with. It's just gonna continue to be more of a problem, so. Yeah, and in fact- There we are. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like most people know this, but, but we should, you know, sort of back up a little bit and say that we have a huge problem with nuisance, with pests in our trees here in West St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And and if you look around and you see dead trees, it's almost always because of emerald ash borer or because of one of these other mm -hmm. pests. Um, and so I know there's one on my block, um, but you know, also we, 
they're just kind of everywhere, but we, um, we have created programs in the city to help people um, to at least bring the cost down. So you can, if you have an emerald, or if you have an ash tree, you can get it treated. And, um, and it is extremely effective to stop emerald ash borer from mm -hmm. taking over your trees. Um, and we have, you know, it's, it's not inexpensive, but we have a partnership with a tree service that will actually give you a discount if you go through us yep. because of the partnership that we have with the city. Yep. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about is just the possibility, but this is not a thing right now, but that we could potentially offer to people like we can roll this into your property taxes mm -hmm. if you can't afford to pay for it we can we can mitigate the yeah thing. we can abate it and then do yeah. an assessment and then do an assessment which then spreads it over multiple years you know and uh and i think that would be something where if you have if you get a letter from the city that isn't like you have to take this immediately but like this is on notice you really need to know about this um reach out to staff and if you're interested in like, hey, I can't afford to do this, but I do want to deal with this problem, mm -hmm. staff will talk to you. I'm sure they will be helpful and try to figure out a method to get you there. I mean, we want yeah. we want to help. We again, I say yeah. it all the time. <laughs> the city is really not here to try to get you to spend money and to try and make your life difficult. We really want to make everything easier for people. Yeah. And the best thing to do is just reach out, you yeah. know, and and get connected to the right people, and they'll do what they can to try and find a, a solution that that's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing in Open Council work session was cannabis use in parks. Um, we decided not to do anything. <laughs> well, and that yeah. and that's it, it, we're going to have Parks and Rec take a look at it. Um, yeah. The advisory council, which I think is really good, and staff also. Shouldn't laugh about it. It's, it's you know, a, it's, it's a tricky situation because what we have is, you know, obviously people have concerns about if you're in a park, some people are not comfortable with people using cannabis. Now, cannabis becomes illegal or legal to use as of August 1st. And so there are some methods you can do with restricting it in parks. But the problem is you're putting us in, you're putting, number one, you're putting our police officers in a situation where they have to go up to people and tell them, hey, you got to put that out, or technically give them a petty misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of problems with that. And one of them is we allow smoking mm -hmm. in parks. We allow people to consume alcohol in cans in parks. Now, number one, you can't tell if somebody's consuming an edible in a park. You can't, you know, whether it is a, I mean, technically you could look at a can that says something if it's a seltzer, but you know, if it's a gummy or whatever, I don't know what you're using. And that gets trickier when you get to vaping, when you get to hand-rolled cigarettes and you get to cigars and all these other things where I, I you know, I don't want to put our officers in a position where they're trying to assess what somebody's using and also get into those conversations with people that are not trying to do anything bad, but don't understand the regulation. I mean, where the, the oldest story in the book right now is none of us understand what's going on with legalized cannabis because it's just happening now. And so we kind of put a holding pattern I think on that for now until we can look into it more because I think if we were trying to restrict cannabis use but not other smoking products and honestly many people have as much or more issue with people smoking cigarettes by playgrounds and stuff mm -hmm. like that and that's currently allowed right so if we were to do some change it would have to be a little more global yeah and I don't I don't know how people are going to feel about that this is another one where maybe some input would not be the worst thing in the world because yeah. um, I get it, you know, I'm sure there are parents that don't want their kids to see somebody smoking weed, but they also don't necessarily want to see their kid, have their kids see somebody smoking a cigarette, and they might not yeah. like to see their kids seeing somebody vape. And so if we have, it's not an easy answer, you know, there's no, there's no simple way to deal with this. And, you know, we're going to keep looking at it, and, and we may add some restrictions, and we have some limited legal recourse on how we can do this but at the same time i don't think we're there yet i don't think we know how to do it yet and anything we do can easily be superseded yeah by the state i mean that was part of it too was yeah. just feeling like the state is talking about taking this up next year and like you know and so there's a possibility that this is going to change anyway yeah. but yeah i mean i think that what we were sort of getting at was that there are things that we you know like i think we all sort of were like, yeah, no, smoking in the park, not cool. Also, like, maybe we don't want to criminalize this. Maybe right. we can think of 
better ways to yep. approach this yep. that don't just create sort of more more criminalization. Yep, exactly, which <laughs> more, is part of what is they're trying to avoid. Right. <laughs> so, so feedback, thoughts, ideas, yep. we would love to hear them. Yep. Um, yeah, and then we can get on to council, but you know, honestly, the bulk of what happened was the open council yeah. work session yes. stuff. So the things that we took up in council were not nearly as exciting. Um, no, I mean, it's all exciting. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Uh, we did take up, um, yeah, we, we had four pretty, I think, pretty minor changes to our city charter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think any of that is even, most of it's bookkeeping. The one change that we had that might be more considerable is when the city sells land. Right now, uh, we do it by ordinance rather than resolution. Ordinance requires two readings. Resolution requires one meeting. And so the reason for that is still we'll have public input, absolutely, for that resolution. But what we have run into is sometimes we have a project that's time sensitive and it delays by two meetings, the ability to say, okay, this is a project we like, this is a good way to use city resources, but we have to do this over. And sometimes it isn't even two meetings in a row because something right. else, and so now suddenly it's a month. And when people are developing in our city, you know, obviously we want to get them to do everything very well, but it's nice for them to not have to wonder, well, how long is it going to take before I can do the next step? Because those, there are so many steps. People don't always see that. I do because I'm on the planning commission. Yeah. There are a lot of hoops to jump through for any development that comes to the city. And this seems yeah. like a rational way to just at least eliminate some of the time lag. And, you know, it's different. Yeah. It costs a lot more to build in the winter than it does in the summer. There are a lot of factors that figure into this. So I think that one was the only one that might be a little, well, why are they doing that? That's yeah. the reasoning behind it. And there still will absolutely be public input. None of that's getting taken away. It's just literally a procedural thing where we had to have two meetings to do the one thing. Yeah. And we only had one public meeting anyway. So it was kind of redundant. So I think it's a good change. The other things were uh, really, I mean, they really were clerical mm -hmm. in in effect. Um, yeah. One was making sure that it said appointed or elected leaders are allowed to vote um, before it just said elected leaders were yeah. allowed to vote, but appointed leaders have always been yeah. allowed Yeah, so we're just vote. cleaning that up and then... And then the other was um, saying that we follow the state statute. With uh, special elections, which yeah. we do. Which we do. But now it says that we do it, right. <laughs> which is cleaner. Yeah. Um, and then, do you want to take the... Yeah, I can run through these because these are both kind of Planning Commission related. So we did two things that just went through the Planning Commission. One was changing the requirements for drive-throughs. A lot of that is changing where drive-throughs can exist in the city. There's a lot of places where drive-throughs just don't make a lot of sense. And part of it's the lot size just doesn't allow for it. And some of it was also clean up a very specific language about, we won't get into the details, but like stacking of cars and things like that, which have been up until now like up to staff discretion. Well, the problem with that on a legal thing is if I come in and I want to put in a drive through and the staff says, well, you need, you know, 200 feet and this other use needs 140 feet. If I'm the person that needs 200 feet and has to have a larger parcel of land or can't fit something in, natural reaction is going to be to say, well, you're just choosing to capriciously say, I, you don't like what I'm doing, so we're not, it's not what we're doing, but I, it's a, it's a valid argument. And so we established a specific minimum stacking for any drive-through, which then takes that off. We'll still be able to ask for more in a conditional use permit, but it does take away that sort of mystical staff, <laughs> staff interpretation, yeah. which staff doesn't want either. Staff doesn't want to have to like decide those things because they know that it opens up, you know, Animals. questions as well so yeah and uh, yeah it was pretty sensible stuff I think I don't think anybody's gonna be sad about this um, we did see a big increase in drive-throughs during the pandemic and requests for drive-throughs I think we're seeing that slow down considerably and overall I don't think most cities are looking to have as many drive-throughs as humanly possible I think there's uh, there's things about drive-throughs that sometimes are necessary for a particular business but in most cases they add idling cars and air pollution and pedestrian interactions and a lot of other things that aren't super desirable with drive throughs So they were just kind of cleaning that up and maybe having it a little more restrictive to just make things make more sense so we don't get into situations where we have a drive through that's 
problematic <laughs> yeah. and uh, and not in the right place. And this just makes that easier to just say, no, nope, there aren't any drive throughs right. in this particular area because none of these lots can support it. So you don't start down the rabbit hole of having to deny an application. Yeah, yeah. When you, don't, yeah. And it, when you know it's not going to go right. through from the beginning. Um, yeah. And then the other one uh, was a site plan for construction of a clubhouse at 430 Mendota Road. Um, it's a multifamily uh, apartment unit. It's been around for a long time, uh, well-maintained. Um, it's a great plan. Yeah. I mean, it, it adds uh, a lot of amenities for the people that live there, a pickleball court, a fire pit, gardens, an enclosed dog park. It looks really nice. A little cl a clubhouse yeah. for gathering as a community thing. I think there was even like a virtual was golf, a thing golf thing in there. Yeah, which yeah. I didn't even see that the first time around. Yeah. And I will say this, and I think that it carried through tonight, um, I've been on the planning commission for quite some time. I said this in the meeting and the number of commissioners on the planning commission that thanked the applicant for how it looked and the idea behind it and, and how they've done everything. Yeah. I'm super positive. And, and when you look at the plans, it is super positive. I mean, it's, it's a dream come true. Everything is done within the rules that we have. And it's just a huge additional amenity that somebody's offering within our city. And, yeah. and, and when you see that, you, you really do need to applaud it. It's right. really nice when you see somebody who's clearly trying to make their location a better place for their residents and a better place for the city in every way. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of a slam dunk on that one. I think there wasn't a lot of, lot of worry there. So um, the last thing that I want to mention before we go is uh, we had we had the chance to um, introduce Eric Weiss, our new parks director. And in fact, this is really relevant because we had a few comments um, from folks in our community who um, were you know who wanted to talk about like things with parks. Well, now we have an official parks director. Mm -hmm. Okay, he has a much longer title than that, and I mm -hmm. don't remember what it is. Do you uh, like sustainability? parks, recreation, engagement, and sustainability. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that's it. Today I'm awake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but we're really excited to have Eric Weiss who wants to bring a real vision for our parks. Um, it's something we have, um, obviously like we have vision for our parks and mm -hmm. we've invested a ton of money in our parks. Um, I think the mayor was going through the list and you know, we've, we've, put close to $10 million into our parks in the last decade, decade um, and plan to continue to do mm -hmm. that. But this is a real opportunity to have a person who is going to just drive parks programming, drive updates to the parks, drive um, conversations about what kinds of parks we want in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really excited to have Eric and hopeful that, um, that having a person in that position will help us to sort of um, just continue to grow and kind of unleash parks. the visionary side of our parks. I yeah. think that because parks is technically we reorganized and that's why we have this position and parks has been a subsection of our public works and they did a great job and I'm not saying anything bad about any of that, but having it have a literal, it's its own department independent with a director that's dedicated to it can only do good things for us. I think that Definitely. was a good move. And it allows us to, to really move forward with not only doing the great job that we're doing now, but as we do new parks and as we look at new parks, I think you're gonna see a lot more big ideas yeah. in general and, 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 and on all of this stuff. And that's important, you know, we're at that spot. Hooray for us, we've gotten to the point where we can do big things. Now we need somebody that can really bring the big things to the table with the help of our Parks and Rec uh, Advisory Committee. Um, yeah. And then I'll just throw in one last thing because I mentioned in the meeting, but I want to mention it again, um, as somebody in the north end of the city, please, please take some time, spend some money at the businesses that we have along the Annapolis construction area. It's always going to be, anytime you have construction in front of your business, it's going to be something that's going to affect you. Um, you can get to all of them. You can get to El Cabano. You might have to go a little bit out of the way to get there. They're open. Gallagher's is open. Rocco's is delivering pizzas. I'm forgetting other people that are also affected by this, but <clears throat> you know, as a community, we love our small businesses. I think that that's something I've always seen in West St. Paul. And this is a time to maybe make a little effort, get an extra sandwich, bring somebody that hasn't been to Gallagher's there, be, uh, you know, for the first time, you know, 
go sit on the patio outside of El Cubano and just kind of bring bring some business to them because you know anytime there's a disruption of the roads that connect you to something it's easy to just go I'll just go somewhere else but the last thing we want to do is have those businesses suffer because construction is a necessary thing when we're done with Annapolis I think everybody is going to be so incredibly excited but we don't want to see a bunch of people suffer during that, you know, for our eventual luck of having a wonderful road, I don't want to see those businesses put in jeopardy of any kind yeah. by having it, that access cut off. There's nothing we can do about it, but, but yeah, I'd really encourage you. And if you haven't gone to any of these places I mentioned, they're all fantastic. They're all wonderful. They really are. And if you have been, and it's been a little while, carve out, carve out a weekend and go grab some stuff from these guys. They, they could use your help. Yeah. Oh, and I'm just going to really quickly plug the pad drive for yes. the women of West St. Paul. Emily has come to make sure that we're paying attention to it the last couple of meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. And um, But it is an incredible thing. And for five years, the women of West St. Paul have raised thousands, tens of thousands of dollars and, um, and put period products in uh, our local organizations to help folks in our community um, to eliminate period poverty. It's super impactful, really important. And a really easy way to do something that like just donate to them or donate products to them and help them to meet their goals. They're halfway to their goals and halfway through the time of the drive. Um, so now is a really great time to jump in. And if you want to help with that <clears throat> or you want more information on that, www.womenofwsp.com. If you go there, you'll get all the information you could possibly want and chip in, do some stuff. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye.